What is up, Steeler Nation? We are back with another episode of the sick podcast, Steeler Crazy. I am JY. This is Mike Up Sports One. We have a national guest today. We're really excited from front office sports. So we're just going to get to it. Sammy, roll it. Turn up your volume. Your volume. Because you're about to listen to The Sick Podcast. Steelers Crazy. Harris Smith Shields. Flacco Polamalu takes it home. Super Bowl 43. Pittsburgh might be bound for that thanks to number 43. The sickest Pittsburgh Steelers podcast. Sports entertainment like no other. It's going to be sick. Yeah, man. Good stuff. We're switching it up a little bit today. A couple goofballs like us. Anytime we get a chance to talk business with somebody, of course, uh, who is esteemed as our next guest, it's always very exciting. So he's held key roles at Sports Illustrated, USA Today, the Wall Street Journal, just to name a few. Uh, You said it before. Right now, he's a senior writer for Front Office Sports. We're excited to welcome on Michael McCarthy. How are you guys? Good. Good. Thanks for joining us. We're really excited to talk with you about a variety of subjects. Uh, and I want to start with something you probably have got a million times, but you know we have to ask. This is the first time meeting you. How how annoyed do you get when people mistake you for Cowboys, former Packers <laughs> coach, Mike McCarthy? How often do you get that? Uh, I get it practically every day on Twitter. Uh, it's it's a funny thing. I like to say that Mike McCarthy is kind of the John Smith of Irish names. <laughs> and uh, I was particularly getting it during Super Bowl week in Phoenix. Uh, and, and I'll tell you, it's really funny. People uh, go after you on Twitter and they're like, you stink. You're the worst coach ever. You can't coach an offense. You have no clock management. And then you say, hey, I'm not that Mike McCarthy. They're like, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> they're like real polite. <laughs> Like, if I was that Mike McCarthy, they would give me all the venom. <laughs> One day you should just go with it. And uh, yeah. <laughs> I do. I, I have fun with it. You know, sometimes <laughs> you I let them go. And sometimes I say, hey, you know, don't, don't worry about it. Yeah, well, right. you said there's a lot more Mike McCarthy's out there. So yeah. probably not He's the a Pittsburgh guy, out. too, right? Um, yeah, our, the Mark Mike McCarthy in Dallas, absolutely a Pittsburgh guy. Yeah. Uh, he's a Super Bowl champion. So at the end of the day, it could be worse, I suppose, yeah. in terms yeah. of Good folks company. you'd be compared to. Uh, anyway, we mentioned, obviously, your role. Uh, very excited to have a senior writer, front office sports on. We're going to talk to you about a, a variety of things that I was really excited to get into and delve deep. The first thing is something that just completed, the NFL draft, Michael. This has become a national phenomenon. I mean, the growth of this thing throughout the years it is mind-blowing. So 11.4 million viewers – you're somebody, obviously, that you know has has followed this for a while. Of course, yep. what do you attribute the growth of this to? As you say, it's uh, become uh, the NFL's Coachella, as uh, Adam right. Schefter said, or or the, or the Woodstock of the NFL. I, I think I attribute it to uh, a couple of different factors. One, you're talking about the country's most popular sport. People simply cannot get enough of the NFL. It's a 24/7 sport, 365 day a year. We're obsessed with it. We follow it. Second, the draft, as somebody put it in our feature story, is about hope. It's kind of like Christmas Day if you're a football fan. If you're a Steelers fan, you want to know who's inside that nice, shiny present you're going to unwrap under your Christmas tree. You know, this year it was, uh, I believe, a tackle, right? And, you know, next year it's a quarterback. So the, the, the draft represents hope for every fan base. And, and that's one of the reasons why I think it's so uh thing. And then, you know, you, you look at it as purely as a TV property. It's part reality show. It's part game show. It's part fashion show. You know, everybody's getting dressed to the nines. The wives are there. The mothers are there. The girlfriends are there. It's, it's just fun, great television. Sports are really one of the only things that you get to watch live anymore. Uh, I've certainly, you know, been able, the, the mystery of it all, like you said, is, is something that, is incredibly, incredibly enticing, and I, and I fully agree. A guy that has helped grow this, uh, you know, individually is Mel Kuyper Jr. Mm. Uh, I remember, of course, Jordan and I watching the draft when we're 13 years old, and he's right. really the only guy breaking this down with his – when we used to get magazines from the airport, Yep. right? Yeah. That was the only thing you, – you, that was the only way to learn about these players. Uh, and I saw, you know, you retweeted some really interesting things 
Uh, I don't think they were satire. But uh, in regard to Mel Kuyper potentially being a Hall of Fame type figure, uh, how do you feel about that, Michael? I think he should be in the Hall of Fame. I think he is the godfather of draft gurus. Uh, everybody from Daniel Jeremiah to Todd, Todod, Todd, Todd yeah. uh, McShay, <laughs> you know, would tell you just like you did. They grew up watching Mel Kuyper and idolizing Mel Kuyper and try to figure out how to be the next Mel Kuyper. But you know, here we are. We're forty years in. This was his fortieth draft, and that wow. doesn't even go back to ESPN's first, uh, which was in nineteen eighty. So uh, he's still going strong. And in the way I think I look at it is, did he change the sport? Did he have a huge impact on the sport of pro football to get into the Pro Football Hall of Fame? And I don't think anybody would argue that that he did. Yeah, no question about that. Uh, let the record show. Mike up sports this year, four correct first round draft picks. Mel Kuyper won. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to work on my own magazine soon. No, uh, just, right. just kidding. He did uh, call you the know. trade up. I will, I will, I will admit that he did call the trade up for the Steelers. Even a blind squirrel, you know, the old saying, uh, yeah. y- y- you know, uh, and so he, we, he's also ahead, responsible for one of the greatest TV moments of all time. I think it was the Colts guy who got on there and he said you know who the hell is mel kuyper my postman yes. knows more about football than mel kuyper uh <laughs> that, that was a great draft moment that gets replayed and replayed on you know every year as soon as the draft rolls around never does get old oh, so we learned that you were a giants fan before yes. coming on of course uh we want to talk to you about all new york things we know a new yorker where are you at right now uh i live in new jersey okay okay but uh but a resident or were you originally from new york Born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, my father was a Giants season ticket holder, going wow. back to Yankee Stadium. And then we went to the Yale Bowl. And then finally, they built this football palace known as Giant Stadium, 1976, 1977. Went to the games with my dad, you know, saw all the grades from Starbuck on, you know, Elway. Yeah. Uh, lived through the 86 Giants, the 90 Giants. Uh, just, a, you know, a wonderful football experience growing up. How do you feel about Brian Dable? Love him. Uh, you know, to me, he's kind of a, a Parcells uh, type coach, gets the most out of his players, you know, knows how to motivate. Well, one of the craziest things about Giant history is if you look at the what ifs, what if Giant coaches, you would be shocked. Do you know that at one time they had both Vince Lombardi and uh, Tom Landry as assistant coaches? I did not. And they I let them both go. That's insane. <laughs> and they, these were assistant coaches, and they let them both go in favor of Ali Sherman. My father loved to tell you that story. And then, of course, Bill Belichick was the architect of the defense on those two giant Super Bowls under Parcells. And they let him go for a guy who was out of the league a, a year later. So, I mean, those two what ifs, if, if those three coaches had remained in New York coaching the Giants, oh my God, I, I can't even think about it. Yeah. Happy we could get your perspective on the G-Men. We're going to transition a little bit, Jordan, here, because the impact that the G-Men have on the Steelers has not been as profound as another AFC team that has, of course, been in the national spotlight for not just a few weeks now, but ever since the end of last season before the darkness retreat uh, and whatnot. Jordan, I'll pass it along to you. Yeah, so the Steelers jumped the Jets for Broderick Jones, uh, offensive lineman. Uh, obviously, we needed the protection for Kenny Pickett. Just kind of talk about, uh, just shed some light on that for us and your thoughts on that. Uh, the, the draft is uh, always full of surprises like that. I mean, I, I like the Steelers pick. You can't have enough protection, you know, particularly at that position. It's a quarterback league, and you got to keep these quarterbacks upright. Uh, you know, the, the Jets draft was almost irrelevant because of the player they would got outside the draft, yeah. which was Aaron Rodgers. Uh, I can't tell you how excited the tri-state area is about Rodgers coming in. You're talking about a team, the New York Jets, that had the longest postseason drought right now, currently, of any North American team. I mean, it goes back to the Mark Sanchez days, the last time they made the playoffs. That's how hungry these this uh, fan base is for a player of that caliber. And also, if you want to go back to that, when was the last time the Jets had a quarterback of that caliber? I mean, you might have to go to, back to you know Joe Willie Namath, the yeah. patron saint of all Jets fans, back to Super Bowl three. So uh, the excitement about Rodgers coming to New York is off the hook. 
With that being said, how do you feel that that impacts the AFC? Like, does that automatically make them a contender? Uh, is it still Patrick Mahomes? Is it a new, are the Steelers up and cut? Like, just give us, you know, what impact does that have on the AFC football conference? Well, I think it makes them instant Super Bowl contenders. If you look wow. at the Jets' talent level, it's they are loaded up and down. They got a great young defense. And I, I think what they really needed was somebody like Rodgers to put them over the top. I mean, who's that quarterback they threw in last year for a couple of games? Mike somebody? You know what Mike I mean? White, yeah. Mike, Mike White, Mike White. And Jet, yeah. Jet fans were so desperate for offense, they were like singing Mike White's praises. Like, you Zach know, he Wilson was beat us. I hate to say that. Uh, <laughs> At home. Yeah, I know. So I, I'd like to. I'd like to forget that memory in uh in Steeler Land. But uh, what what do but, you but, think? But to answer your first question, I think the AFC is still Mahomes' conference. Yeah. Uh, I was at the Super Bowl, and this guy was running around on one leg, and he still beat the Eagles. I yeah. mean, that run he broke off late in the game when you know he should have been in the locker room getting treatment. The guy is special. So until you know somebody could take out the Chiefs, it's still their conference. Definitely. Um. New York is, is is so big, obviously, the Big Apple. Um, what do you think Aaron Rodgers, like, his relationship with the media? Like, do you think – like, you know you know how he is. Like, he likes to be in the spotlight and yeah. knows when to make the announcements at the right time. But New, New York is – I mean, Pittsburgh, you know, people – basically just eat permani sandwiches and go to the Steeler game, go come home from church and they're, you know, they throw on their Steeler jersey. Like it's just the way of life. Like we don't have beaches here. We don't have, you know, the the big city. Pittsburgh's a beautiful city, but New York media, I, I know any athlete that it, it, you're just on a bigger scale. So how do you think yeah. that his relationship with will will be with the media? That is the most fascinating story of the season. Uh, as you said, Rogers is a smart guy. He's very quotable but he's also peevish and thin-skinned, and he likes to totally control his own narrative. And you cannot do that in New York. You can't do that with the New York media. As Michael uh, Strahan just said, they're untamable. You can't tame them. Yeah. Uh, but, I mean, I, if you saw his introductory press conference, he was on his best behavior. He was uh, smiling. He was chatting up reporters, calling them by their first names. Is it like the Knicks money. game? Is it the Rangers yeah. game? Yeah. And he's embracing the whole New York thing. He's not coming in here with an attitude. He's coming in here in a way like a small town person. And the song says that, you know, I want to yeah. be a part of it. He wants to be a part of New York. And I think that attitude will go such a long way towards winning over the press. Because uh, the press is like everybody else. You know, if you're on the jet beat, you want to write stories that people care about. You want to cover a team that people care about. You don't want to you know, write about another loss, another loss, another loss. You want to go to the playoffs. You want to go to the Super Bowl. So yeah. in a way, I think the, the media is pulling for him to win as almost as much as the fans are. Definitely. We're hanging out with Michael McCarthy. He's a senior writer over at Front Office Sports. Make sure you check out all of his work and make sure you check out Front Office Sports uh, anytime, of course, you're looking for the, the great business side uh, of things. So I'm just curious, as you were chatting there, we're a bit removed. How was Eli Manning's relationship with the media? Eli Manning had a great relationship with the me media yeah. for one simple reason. He didn't give two dams. It wasn't bad to the media. You know, he, he was always respectful. He would always give you a quote. But it was kind of like uh, Derek Jeter. The quotes were always vanilla. Mm. Uh, he didn't get mad if somebody ripped him in the press. You know what I mean? He didn't get high if somebody... Uh, you know, said he was great. He was just such an even keeled guy. And guys like that also do very well with the media. But, uh, I, you know, I think Rogers is passionate. You know, Rogers is a guy who's, who's quotable. And, and that's the type of guy that the media loves here, too, because they want, most of all, somebody who's a fighter, right? Somebody who's going to come in and fight and win and deliver. That's why in New York, it's funny, you only have to win once, I mean, we're not spoiled like Boston fans. You don't have to win seven titles. You can win once. Mark Messier came in here in '94. He won one championship, and he's still a legend. He could, yeah. you know, he couldn't. He he couldn't pay for a drink in any bar in Manhattan right now. <laughs> and Namath is the same way, right? Namath is a living yeah. saint from winning Super Bowl three. He won once. So if Rodgers can come in and win once, he's going to be a god. He'll be a. Uh, he'll get the parade down the Canyon of Heroes. Uh, he'll get the key to the city. It, it would really be something. Yeah, I've been talking to a lot of Jets fans that totally agree. They don't care about the next 10 years if they go 0-17 for nine years post-Super yep. Bowl. 
they'll take one Super Bowl, of course. And it happened, of course, with Brady and Tampa, Stafford with the Rams, similar uh, formula there that got those teams Super Bowls. So something and, that and I want to yeah, go ahead. with the Broncos. I mean, so it, yeah, that's, Manning. Yeah, that's, that's an example. excellent point. You have, you have three examples of quarterbacks late in their career who made this kind of switch. And not only did it energize them, energize the game, but they won the big one. When Brett Favre made the switch, he was still pretty good. Yeah. The team won a lot of games. And, and I'll tell you this, too, about Favre. People don't realize it when you know they talk about the big, bad New York media. Media loved Brett Favre, the Jets media. You know yeah. what I mean? Because he came in and he won. He only started to turn on him when he got hurt and his arm fell off. And then, you know, he was off to Minnesota. But sure. when he came in and he turned around the Jets and he was winning games, the media loved him. Yeah, I think missed the playoffs by one game that year. Oh. One thing before a transition to Jordan, something a lot of Pittsburghers have been chatting about because we have a ton of fans across the country, not just across the country, but across the world, right, who generally will – stream the game from a different service, right? They're, they're not watching cable. Uh, and you have these streaming services now, like YouTube TV, you know, charging $400 million for an NFL package. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I find it very interesting, you know, kind of what the future landscape of NFL television viewership holds. Uh, I feel like you're somebody that would be a really good person to ask what the future you know, what are we looking at in 10 years mm. in terms of cable and, and, you know, streaming services? Yeah. Well, I think uh, streaming is on the upside uh, because that's where the younger consumers are. And all the leagues are trying to reach younger fans. Cable is on the downside. Uh, the number of cable uh, homes has gone from, you know, 100 million to 60 million. That's mm -hmm. shocking. That's, you know, it just a, a destruction of the business model. I mean, ESPN has gone from 100 million homes to 73 million homes in 20 years. But uh, you know what's uh, interesting, what's coming back uh, big time in terms of the future? We're going back to the future. We're going back to broadcast television. Remember the, yeah. the broadcast television that we grew up in the old days with the four channels and the mouse ears and all yeah. that stuff? Well, that's becoming uh, very popular again to leagues because it's free. Everybody has that channel on their TV. You're still going to get 100 million homes. And you know what I mean? You, you could charge money for advertising and rates for advertising that you can't touch with streaming. Definitely. So uh, one more question before we get you out of here, Michael. Uh, I always like to ask this when we have, you know, national guests on because we have a lot of local guys on here uh, and Steeler reporters. What is like from your perception, the national perception, maybe even you personally, like what like the Pittsburgh Steelers are going into the 2023 season? If you could just sum it up in a few sentences. Uh, classic franchise where the NFL is better when the Steelers win. Uh, wow. You know, there's a nice. couple of there's a couple of franchises that I cover uh, nationally that are simply nationally popular. They drive the ratings. You know, number one mm -hmm. is the Dallas Cowboys. Number two is the uh, Pittsburgh Steelers. Number three is the Green Bay Packers. You know, four you could debate. Maybe it's the Giants. Maybe it's the Patriots. Maybe it's the 49ers. But those three teams drive the ratings. And the NFL is always better when the Steelers are great. Uh, I'll tell you another story, too. Uh, I don't know if this is true or not, but uh, this is – I remember from the Steelers story. The Steelers were supposed to be America's team. Uh, we're, the world, we're the world's team. <laughs> I think the Cowboys didn't have that. <laughs> the Cowboys stole that from the Steelers. Somebody yeah. went to the Steelers first and said, we want to call you America's team in a documentary. They were like, no, 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 you can't do that. And then they went to the Cowboys, and the Cowboys were like, sure, we'll be America's team. <laughs> so the Steelers wow. are the real America's team. You heard it here first. Hey, we really appreciate uh, you coming on. And just tell all the people before you get off here where they can, you know, find your work and, and check out your writings and stuff. Sure. You can find me at uh, M. McCarthy Rev on Twitter and frontofficesports.com. We're at the intersection of sports and business. We're one of the fastest growing publishers uh, in the country. We're kicking ass news wise, and we'd love it if you'd come and check us out. Definitely. Well, hey, we always appreciate. Uh, someone like you coming on our show mm. with all the accolades and all the knowledge that you have. So we'll we got a curse word in there. Yeah. <laughs> we, he, podcast mode, baby. There podcast you go, man. Mode. Let it all out. You don't have to ask permission on the sick podcast. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Michael. Let it loose. Have a good thanks, one. Thanks, guys. And good luck with the pod. Thank, Thank you. you sir. 
All right, Jordan, good episode, uh, good time as always. Want to, of course, tell the viewers about what we have moving forward, uh, which includes, you know, some more Steeler players. We're getting closer to guys getting back from the beach, right? They, they've yeah. been vacationing. They have been, you know, in coladas by the pool. Uh, and it's just about time. I know the rookies are reporting OTA soon, but it's just about time where they're heading back to Pittsburgh to start working out with the team. Uh, and they'll definitely be making themselves available to us. So we're really excited to continue the sick podcast, Steelers Crazy, with more great guests like Michael, more Steelers. Uh, and next week, I know we have some really cool analysts coming on as well to talk Steelers football, Jordan. So another good episode over here. Happy to bring it to you. Yeah. Uh, Jordan, go get yourself a nap and uh, take care of yeah, Aria well, a little bit. Before we go, make sure that you check out with Steelers' new running back, Jordan Bird. We just put yeah. that out there. Probably the fastest man I've ever seen. He might give Tyree Kill a run for his money. Love it. Um, so make sure you check that out. And this has been another episode of the sick podcast, Steeler Crazy. I am Jay York Football. This is Miked Up Sports One. Make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcast and stay crazy. Sammy, hit it. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the sick podcast Steelers Crazy on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts.